One of the most recurring debates in international relations boils down to a simple question. Why do states form alliances? There is considerable consensus on the motivation of states to form alliances. States with more allies are generally more secure. But how do states choose allies? Why do states choose certain allies over others at different times or circumstances? Disagreements over these questions about alliance making takes up a significant portion of international relations. Even at a cursory glance, answers to these questions seem pretty important. If we can understand how states choose allies, we might be able to figure out strategies to make even more allies. Or better yet, we can figure out strategies to reduce the number of allies our opponents have, whoever they may be. It could also help us better understand the ebb and flow of international politics. It would help us better understand when the states would go to war or when states would pursue peace. The field of international relations have been around for a long time. Scholars in international relations try to come up with theories to explain or predict alliance systems and alliance-making behavior based on different theoretical frameworks. There are the constructionists, the idealists, the institutionalists. There are even the postmodernists. But the prima donna of international relations in the debate of alliance making is realism. Yes, this is yet another video about a realist theory, but it's not what you think. Or it might be. I don't know you. I'll go through the most relevant parts of realism again. If you want more, you can find more videos about realism on my channel or other places. Realism in general tries to analyze the world in terms of state capabilities, or more commonly called power. Power is not limited to military capabilities, but also economic, political, social, and even cultural capabilities. However, most realist analyses focus on military and economic powers. Power really means anything that allows states to secure itself and influence other states in the world. The more influence a state can have, the more secure it can make itself in the world. The world is made up of states. We can colloquially call them nations or countries, or to be more technical, call them nation states. It doesn't really matter what we call them as long as we understand that states are autonomous political entities that can make decisions on internal and external policies. The numerous states in the world have different levels of power. States can have greater, equal, or less power than all the other states. This is called the unequal distribution of capabilities. In a world of states with unequal distribution of capabilities, realism theories then ask the central question: How and why do states form alliances? In structural realism, which was formulated by Kenneth Waltz, states form alliances based on the balances of power. The balance of power theory claims that states behave in ways that counter the threats posed from stronger states. Whenever states behave in a way to balance against another state's power, it's called balancing behavior. And there are two types of balancing behaviors: internal and external. Internal balancing is when a state develops its own capabilities through investing in domestic systems. This can include economic reforms, military investment, improving social stability, and so on. External balancing is the opposite. Whenever a state does something to balance the power outside of its own capabilities, it's called external balancing. Making allies is a common external balancing behavior. States form allies with other states to balance against a more powerful state. War can also be an external balancing behavior. Which can weaken or eliminate other states to improve the relative power of the victorious state. However, wars are also very risky and incredibly costly. So even a victorious state may end up in a weaker position than before. This is why many realists are very conservative regarding military action, except for John Mearsheimer. But we don't talk about him here. In the balance of power theory, alliances are the preferred method of external balancing. When the world is composed of two superpowers, the balance of power anticipates the formation of two large alliance systems. The most obvious example is the Cold War, where many states in the world allied with either the United States or the Soviet Union. The key takeaway is that the two superpowers represent the biggest threat to all the states in the world because they are the most powerful. But there is a problem. The problem with structural realism and balance of power theory is that sometimes the world doesn't behave in the way that the theory anticipates. For example, 
Why is Western Europe allied with the United States when the United States has been the most powerful and most capable state in the world for the past 70 years? Even during the Cold War, the United States was the more powerful state than the Soviet Union in almost every measure. If states truly balance against power, then shouldn't Western Europe be allied with the Russians against the United States? When weaker states ally with a stronger state, it's called bandwagoning. Realist theories can differ on which is more likely, bandwagoning or balancing. Structural realists generally argue against bandwagoning. They claim that bandwagoning is less likely to happen than balancing because if weaker states ally with a stronger state, they actually create an even bigger problem for themselves. The stronger state becomes even stronger. And in a world where states only look at state capabilities, bandwagoning seems like a really bad strategy. But the US alliance system seems to be the example of bandwagoning. The US alliance system is, without comparison, the most powerful grouping of nations in the world. Is structural realism wrong? Or is the US alliance system just an anomaly in world history? This is what Stephen M. Walt tried to resolve. In the world of neo-realism, there is Kenneth N. Walt, then Stephen M. Walt. Lastly, there is Thomas L. Wall. Just kidding, the last guy doesn't exist, yet. Stephen Walt looked at the US alliance system and thought, what if states are not actually balancing based on power, but balancing based on threat perception? So Stephen Walt came up with a balance of threat theory. The balance of threat theory is a modification of balance of power theory. The balance of threat theory says states balance against other states based on how threatening they are and not necessarily based on how powerful they are. I think this is an important conceptual change in neorealism. Structural realism and the balance of power theory assumed that greater capabilities meant greater threats to other states. But the balance of threat theory questions this linear assumption about capability and threat. In general, a threat is a combination of capabilities and intent. Consider this analogy. A gun has more destructive capability than a knife, but a person with a gun without the intent to use it is usually less threatening than a person with a knife with the intent to use it. Intent plays an important part in how people and states in the world perceive threats. Of course, if a person had a nuclear weapon even without the intent to use it, that alone is quite threatening because of just how dangerous it is. Because the balance of threat theory moves away from strictly analyzing power to threat perception, it allows us to develop a more nuanced analysis of capabilities. In the balance of power theory, all capabilities are supposedly threatening. In the balance of threat theory, different capabilities pose different levels of threats to other states. State capabilities in the balance of threat theory can be divided into different types, such as offensive or defensive military capabilities. States with offensive military capabilities would be perceived as more threatening than those with predominantly defensive military capabilities. This leads to a very interesting possibility. A very powerful state with defensive military capabilities could make alliances more easily than a less powerful state with predominantly offensive military capabilities. The traditional balance of power theory could not even consider this as a possibility. The simple shift from analyzing power to analyzing threat perception makes realism more flexible as a theoretical framework. However, there is a downside to this change. Walt acknowledges in his book that it is not easy for states to determine which military capabilities are offensive or defensive. It also means that scholars would have a more difficult time applying this theory to empirical cases. The balance of threat theory can be more versatile and lead to a more nuanced analysis of state capabilities, but it brings with it problems with clarity. But that is to be expected when a theory accounts for factors based on subjective perception. And that's what's happening with the balance of threat theory. It's accounting for the subjective perceptions of states. A possible workaround to this problem would be to focus on finding empirical evidence of how influential institutions and political actors within a state perceive the capabilities of other states. We personally don't have to decide which capabilities are offensive or defensive. We can look for public statements, white papers, news interviews, and so on from key actors within a state to understand how they perceive the capabilities of other states. I think it's important to acknowledge this aspect of balance of threat theory before moving on to other factors that Stephen Walt analyzes. 
In addition to offensive and defensive military capabilities, Walter takes into account geographical proximity. The closer states are to each other, the more likely it is that they would find each other more threatening. Walt also adds geographical barriers such as mountains, oceans, and deserts as a part of the geographical proximity factor. The two types of military capabilities and geographical proximity affect each other. States with offensive military capabilities would appear less threatening if they are further away. The inverse would also be possible. Let's move on to the other factors in the balance of threat theory. Intent and ideology. Intent is such a strange factor to be discussing within realism. Realist theories tended to assume that all states behave according to balance of power considerations, and they do so to increase their security. Structural realism assumes all states have similar intentions, which are to survive in an anarchic world. While that assumption might be true at some fundamental level, it is also not very useful or helpful in understanding how states behave. States have different intentions, and how those intentions are perceived by others play an important role in how states behave and how its neighbors react. Walt's final analysis of the Soviet Union is revealing. Walt claims that one of the reasons for the European hostility towards the Soviet Union is found in how they perceive each other's intentions. The Soviet Union was supposedly expecting the European states to be prone to bandwagoning. This expectation in how European states behave led to the Soviet Union prone to making threatening or coercive behaviors. Weaker states bandwagon with the stronger state, so the Soviets wanted to prove how strong they were. The result has been a counterproductive reliance on threats and intimidation, ranging from Stalin's pressure on Turkey, Iran, and Norway to the more recent attempts to browbeat NATO into halting deployment of intermediate range nuclear missiles. I especially like how Walt snuck in a little bit of idealism in this section of the book. That the Soviet Union expected European states to bandwagon is neither about power nor threats, but about ideals and beliefs of how states would or should behave. In realist terms, this is almost heresy. In realism, you do not talk about how norms and ideas affect state behavior. But Walt does so to explain the Soviet Union's hostile behavior towards European states, and it makes a whole lot more sense than simply saying all states want to maximize security. Taking all these factors into account, Walt can provide an explanation for why Western Europe has been allied to the United States instead of the Soviet Union. The United States has more offensive and defensive military capabilities than the Soviet Union, but Walt finds an interesting implication from this disparity. Because the United States has more power projection capabilities, it focused more on intervening in what is commonly called the third world countries, often on moralistic ideals to its own detriment. This apparently led to many of the third world countries to develop a threatening perception of the United States. Conversely, the Soviet Union, because it has less power projection capabilities, focused more on threatening its more immediate European neighbors to secure itself. While providing more political support to third world countries, Walt claims that the United States was perceived to be more threatening to third world countries, while the Soviet Union was perceived to be more threatening to Europeans. Furthermore, the United States and Europe are separated by the Atlantic Ocean, while the Soviet Union is stretched across the Eurasian landmass and located right next to each other. While the Soviets did not have to respond to its rather poor geographical location. It relied on its long history of expansionism and paranoia, and falsely believed that the Europeans would bandwagon instead of balancing against threats. We should be careful not to ignore Walz's nuanced analysis. The Soviet Union's hostile policies towards the European states is not solely due to its geopolitical and military factors, but also its expected norms and political culture that produced this counterproductive policy. In his book, Walt provides an interesting and quite unorthodox answer to one of realism's long-standing problems: why the United States alliance system goes against the expectations of the balance of power theory. He ended up revising neorealism to be more open and flexible by moving away from the strict, abstract, and simplified theoretical concepts and approaches in structural realism. 
He incorporates into realism concepts long abhorred by realists, such as subjective perceptions of capabilities and threats, as well as intentions, norms, and ideologies in explaining how alliances are formed. It is a bit surprising that Walt considers himself a realist scholar, despite eschewing many of the central tenets that have characterized realism. That is also why Walt is probably my favorite realist scholar, because he attempts to change realism into something more useful and weirder, and I like weirder theories. Before I finish this video, I want to go over one other thing about the balance of threats theory. Walt spends most of his book testing the balance of threat theory against the empirical cases of Middle Eastern politics between 1950s and 1980s. He tests several hypotheses arising from the balance of threat theory by looking at how Middle Eastern states formed alliances. One of the most interesting conclusions from his analysis is that regional balancing of threats is mostly agnostic to global balancing of threats. Apparently, Middle Eastern states did not form alliances based on which superpower, the United States or the Soviet Union, were the most threatening at the global scale. The Middle Eastern states formed alliances based primarily on regional threats, while only allying with either superpower based on how much aid they can receive. Both superpowers had a difficult time influencing and changing the behaviors of their regional allies, even if they spent enormous amounts of military and financial aid. Indeed, Middle Eastern states would frequently change alliances between the Soviets and the United States. Realist theories tend to focus on how major powers of the world behaved to illustrate how the balance of power works. The assumption was that due to the outsized influence the actions of the major powers had on the world, the middling and smaller states would react to the global balancing of power. Walt finds a radically different conclusion from his analysis of Middle Eastern politics. He finds that regional balancing of threats don't really care much about the global balancing of threats. His explanation for this is quite amusing and powerful. Because Middle Eastern states are so much weaker compared to either the United States or the Soviet Union, they didn't care about the global balancing of threats because they believed that whatever they did would not impact the global balance between the United States and the Soviet Union. This meant that they could ally with whomever they want and change their allegiances whenever, because they knew their alliances with either major power would not change anything for the global balance. So, instead of worrying about which major power could become more threatening to the other major power, the Middle Eastern states mainly formed alliances with regional and global powers based on regional threats. Walt concludes about US and Soviet efforts in the Middle East thusly. As shown repeatedly in this study, neither superpower has gained much leverage through the use of military or economic assistance in the Middle East. That is a rather sanguine conclusion about US and Soviet involvement in the Middle East that would not have been possible with the balance of power theory.